This is Mohsin Hamid. Uh, it's a quote from the book, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia. We are all refugees from our childhoods. And so we turn, among other things, to stories. To write a story, to read a story, is to be a refugee from the state of refugees. Writers and readers seek a solution to the problem that time passes and that those who are gone are gone and those who will go, which is to say every one of us, will go. For there was a moment when anything was possible and there will be a moment when nothing is possible. But in between, we can create. Welcome. I'm here with Chuck Parson. Hey. That's me. Oh, you're supposed to say it. I'm here. Oh, f- Start over. You usually I'm, get, just, okay. All right. I'm here with Chuck Parson. <laughs> <laughs> We're point. so bad at this show. <sighs> One more time. I'm here with Chuck Parson. Hey, I'm here with Brady Harden. And this is, is the a life, life after. after. Um, you know, there's some forces that are too strong to withhold. There's just some forces of nature that are so powerful that you cannot keep them back. Normally, Earthquakes, hurricanes. Yeah, and uh, normally Oops. we keep we keep our... <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. We're, we usually keep our guest until the second segment. Yes. But we cannot withhold this anymore. No. Um, no the, unleashed here in the studio with us is Renee. Hey, Renee. I, y- y'all can't see this, but I'm doing some really cool pistol fingers. Yeah, yeah. There's like guns shooting everywhere, guns slinging. Um, Chuck, what was it this week that you had texted me? There was a um, a topic that you wanted to talk about today, and I thought it was really brilliant. What was it? The episode. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah. Let me, uh, let me, I think I have it right here, actually, Brady. Oh, uh, let me. Oh, look! I opened my phone and there it is. Chuck, you know what this reminds me of is in Veggie Tales. Whenever Bob and Larry would be like, "Oh, we need to figure out what the," and then they would go into Cordy, and that computer would pop up their their Bible story oh, yeah, of the yeah. week. Cordy. So go ahead and pop up your Cordy. Here's phone. Here's my. Uh, all right, this is uh, this is Second Chuck, uh, twenty nine seventeen. Oh God. Oh, like Chuck two, Chuck harder. <laughs> Chuck two, too fast, too Precisely. furious. <laughs> This is second Chuck too fast too furious. Um, I I was texting my one of my, my best friend. He lives in in Louisville. I said, uh, "Hi Bennett." Hey, hi Bennett. He's listening out there. <laughs> oh, B boy. Yeah, yeah. Hashtag Bennett reads my hashtags. Um, I keep thinking back to my young Christian leader self. I remember when some of my close friends started smoking weed. Ooh. And I felt such a strong gut response that he needed to do something about it, changing their minds or something. But I felt this overwhelming powerlessness. I think I wrote a a journal entry about it that's very emotionally charged. Now that my worldview is much more rooted in my intellect, Mm -hmm. I can't help but laugh at my tendency to allow what I believed at the time was a kind of spiritual discernment run my life when it was really just my indoctrination conflicting with the observable truth observable truth of reality wow yeah and then you responded with do you remember what you said back yeah i mean i i dealt with this a lot because because we're talking about conviction that was mm-hmm. sort of the word the key word there is conviction right and really what it is i think for a lot of us was just these black and white regulations that we had upon ourselves to fit inside of a community yes. so there was a time where i went to a r-rated movie with some of my friends yeah and what I, movie was it <laughs> it was grindhouse it was the, the the robert rodriguez quentin tarantino yes, the double double feature. double feature i don't even know how i ended up there in retrospect which but is su- it's such those are good great movies are they though they are I, I okay was like, they are. Meh. Okay. No, they're. Hel- I but, mean, like for what they are, they they're so self aware. It's hilarious. But but the, but the point was is that I I went there and I watched it with a couple of my friends and I, actually I think two of them are listeners of the show and uh, in the, the the movie I was so convicted I felt so bad about the things I was seeing on screen and the way that they were speaking and the bad language they had and all of this that I walked out and I and I, I tried to be as polite with my friends I've actually went back and had this conversation with them recently of like what was that like like was I a douche or was I too self-righteous I'm like no actually you were really polite about it I just I said you know I you guys watch this I'm cool I'm just gonna go hang out in a lobby so right. I did but because it was a double feature <laughs> I was out in the lobby for hours yeah. um and because is this I, like a pre-cell phone too 
where you're like, oh, I, I don't remember. Do I do? You were like, yeah, I probably, you were like, <gasps> you like, it was probably during the time I had that Zach Morris like brick phone, uh-huh. like five yeah. years after everybody else did, because that was a hand me down from my family. But I mean, there was just like this this idea though that if you see something that really bothers you, you I, I was restless until I was able to voice that uh, because I couldn't keep that emotion of like being convicted on their behalf. I couldn't keep that in until I said or did something bold that oh, showed it. Yeah. I think what a lot of it was oh, is that I needed wow. to prove I needed to prove what my stance was because that proving is what made me feel like I was being a spiritual person. Right. Yeah, and, and you also are, are afraid of if you don't say something, then you're illicit or, or sorry, complicit. You're right. complicit yes. in what your friends you're fl- are doing. You're flippant. So I had a friend when I was 17 come out to me mm-hmm. via email and and she she sent me this long letter saying hey, I, I want to be real with you. I'm gay. And I I got it. And I wrote back without even thinking about it or pausing. I want you to know that I love you, but I think homosexuality is wrong. You have to say that. Like, I, feel like I, you I have had to, say, to that. say it so that she knew that I did not approve of right. her actions. And, and I will say, I'm just going to add that this story had a happy ending. And I wrote to her when I was not a Christian and said, hey, I'm really sorry that I had that reaction. And it was two weeks before yeah. she moved to the city. And then we yeah. became best friends and she forgave me. And That's I just awesome. officiated That's her good. wedding. So, Oh, okay. damn. Okay. It's kind of incredible that there's this, there's this pow- the power of indoctrination, right? That we have these strong gut emotional reactions to things that have no, there's really nothing about them that is observably bad, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's... Yes whether it's homosexual, like consensual homosexual relationships or cursing in movies or, you know, smoking weed, which is like what, you know, like I was drinking, I drank a lot of alcohol then because that's like acceptable in church culture, even though that's a way more dangerous drug. If I'm concerned about the right, effects right. and dangers of drugs, Let's like, you know, that's way more, more dangerous. And, but there's this irrational, like, oh, I need to respond to this in a in a christian i need to respond to this morally and i feel a very strong emotion about it and i think it's interesting because while feeling the compulsion to tell people about our convictions about some things we also i at least would stifle confronting people about other things that aren't explicitly um, told to you in the Bible not to be so mm. uh, for for the sake of uh, so, social cohesion so I would not confront people for saying racist. I would not confront people for saying sexist things because those are, um, you're, you're allowed to say them at least in my church culture. So, so I would stifle other things that I had convictions about. I had the ability not to confront people all the time, but I would still with certain things say no you can't be that way no you can't think that way no you can't do that or i just or or even let them do it but uh feel compelled to let everybody know that i thought it was morally wrong mm-hmm. and i think this is yeah. something that really is perpetuated by people with black and white thinking that um like let's look at how ridiculous it gets at times when it comes to and i hate using this example because it's so cliche and obnoxious especially to me as a gay person but when it comes to, like the gay marriage thing of people not wanting to make cakes for people who are so they're like well if i make this cake then i'm saying that <laughs> yeah everybody's Sorry. making this really we're disgusting we're all all like, oh he's so tired of hearing about this but no, it, no it's no, such a I'm tired of hearing but it's about, so obnoxious. We're tired of the I mean, fact that it exists. I know that my marriage was consecrated in the presence of my cake. Right. So. But no, but it's this idea that if I make this cake, then I say that I'm okay with it. And if I'm saying yes, I'm okay with it, totally. then I'm okay with gay sex. And if I'm okay with gay sex, then obviously God's going to charge their sodomy against me. You know that, like, wow, yeah. that if I make this cake, then somehow I am whatever. And I, I think that it's so obnoxious to have this black and white thinking and it's so unhealthy. But um I was living in the midst of that until I stepped away and realized like, no, this is outrageous to really look at it this way. But the people who do black and white thinking um, are the first one to pick up arms when it comes to wanting to fight to death for their belief system uh-huh. there, you know, and so, or, or yeah. I think the equivalent of yeah, nowadays yeah. is they're the first ones to make such a loud, passionate thing. And usually the loudest, most bold one 
get the endorphins running through our bodies of self-righteousness and like, oh my God, like I'm really making a stand and God's going to be proud of me. And because they are kind of like the leaders of that, I think a lot of people fall underneath that. Um, and it becomes like the, the thing that if you, logical Christians can come out and say, no, I'm cool with making a cake even if they're not confirming or not affirming of, of LGBT communities, right. they can say, well, I'm cool with making a cake, even though I don't agree with them. But if they come out and say that they're going to have how many people with this black and white thinking come at them yeah. and attack yeah, them yeah. for, well, no, you're not really a Christian. Happened to Eugene Peterson, whenever it came out that he might be right. accepting of same sex yeah. marriages. Yeah. Well, you know, you need to repent. You need, you know, church discipline. You're not really saved, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And mm-hmm. it goes straight to, well, you're going to go to hell if this well, is what it, your belief it is. It goes straight to whatever it is, whatever it takes to change that person's mind and put them back in line is yes. what it comes down to. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember um, when I was... Uh, th- struggling deconstructing my faith sorry i'm just laughing because you guys use that phrase that it, it works we use it a but, lot, yeah. so when i was deconstructing my faith i applied to work at a christian school and on their application they said what do you think are the biblical views of same-sex marriage oh, yeah. um, and, okay. and i wrote this really long email that was like so i've been studying Biblical gay hermeneutics. I think that here are some of the points that they talk about that you can consider. I said, I think uh, the Bible talks a lot more about loving the poor than it does about gay marriage. Right. So right. let's. Uh, it, 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 so I, I had this very reasoned response, and they wrote back and said, You have to know what you think. You can't be on the fence. You yeah. have to write, make a decision. Yeah. And so it, it wasn't even like I didn't write to them and say, I think being gay is okay. Yay, gay. I said, I don't know what I think about it. Right. And they said, you have to have the same conviction as us or you can't work for us. Right. You, wow. you, not not like this is something that's going to that come so up in a first grade classroom anyway. Yeah, I'm I was going to say, like, how related to what your work, the work that you were doing was that question. <laughs> I'm like, one plus one equals is gay. gay. Yeah. yeah. One plus one, man and man equals yeah. a happy gay marriage. <laughs> You know, uh, I don't, I don't like to, you know, I know it, I don't really care because I think the, I think they're like cool parts of the Bible, right? Mm-hmm. Like there, there's some good stuff in there. Yeah. Um, one of the things I really like about Jesus is that I think I, I heard this statistic once. I don't know. I never like researched it myself, but that he's asked like 97 questions or something in the Bible and he responds to three of them directly. See, I hate that. That's my biggest pet peeve of anybody in the world. But continue. Sorry. Well, but but the point. My point is that uh, he was aware. Like the, the, a lot of the questions that people would ask him were were poignant social issues from the time: divorce or taxes or whatever. Um, things that were like politically charged, the equivalent of our gay marriage and our abortion and okay. our. And he's like, "Here's another question." Because nothing Are you taking is black care of and the white. Poor? Yeah, okay. Because I see what you're he's saying. He's not I, giving this them this prescriptive religion. Like they want, they want like, him to say, "Hey, is divorce wrong?" And he's like, "Let's talk about let's let's unpack what you really mean about this." Right. Yeah. 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 And they're like, "No, no, tell me. Like, I want a black or white answer. Can I bake a cake for a gay guy?" Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Jesus, exactly. And and Jesus is like, he would ask some weird question about chocolate or vanilla, and they'd be like, "I don't know what you mean by that," which is. Perfect, because none, none of this shit is like. I mean, so many things that we that we get into conflicts about are like very gray things, right? You know, that's a very good point. Uh, so I think I'm allowing myself for one of my first times to be okay with gray areas. Yeah, yeah, and I think we all can relate with that here at this yeah. table, right? I mean, not for the first time because I think we've we've gone down this road for a long time, but um, it really just changed the landscape of how we view everything. Um, so we're kind of backwards today because it's kind of like it's. I'm glad to have known you, and now we get to meet you, Renee. Like, yeah, correct. So we just like got to hear your views and all of this stuff, and now we're going to go back and talk about your story. Uh, right after this break, we're going to hear about um, Renee's life as a Christian and how that all came to change. Party on, Wayne. Oh, boy. We'll be back right after this. Hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. 
How's that? Patreon, it's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> and we're back. Hi. Hi. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Renee, um, your deconstruction of leaving the faith, you were brought up in the church, is that correct? I was brought up super Christian. Yeah. So from like from the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. So like, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, like I would say I was destined to be Christian from utero. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Like from I, the foundations. Yeah. Oh. So what like was if, like your... If, if possible, they would have like, they would have like somehow put a little Westminster Shorter Catechism in there for you to I did. Through I did. I did memorize. So my dad is super cool, super academic, and he had us memorize the Westminster Confession of Faith Catechism. Oh, and so in Sunday school, when I'm like literally seven years old, uh, the teacher says, what is sin? And all these kids are raising oh their hands God. and they're like, sin is when you do bad things. And they call on me and I said, sin is any want of conformity <laughs> or transgression to or against the law of God. <laughs> <laughs> and my teacher like pauses and even he's like... A little annoyed, like all the kids are looking at me, like who's this? All right, Renee. Fuck <laughs> you! And the teacher's looking at me, and he says, "What? What does that mean?" I'm like, "Oh, it means when you don't follow Jesus." <laughs> right. Let me put this in layman terms for you plebeians. <laughs> you were just an Angelica a from Rugrats, right? <laughs> yeah, I, it, like an intellectual Angelica. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Anal- that is beautiful. Uh, yeah. I don't know that reference. I probably was not allowed to watch Rugrats. the show. Rugrats. She was, oh, yeah. okay. um, so what was kind of your, you mentioned before there was kind of like one thing that happened when you were a kid where you're just like, oh, I don't know if I buy into all of this. Even as a kid, what yeah. was your first thing? <sighs> okay. Um, when I was a kid and I first heard about Hal, I was traumatized by it like it why it, i mean it's not that big of a deal right no it is a big deal like exactly. it, it, it gave me nightmares like oh. i remember specifically every time i would go to uh, bonfires which ironically a lot of times was at like church retreats i yes. would stare into the bonfires as i'm roasting marshmallows and watching skin peel off of it as it as it goes up in flames and thinking this is what happens if you don't believe in God. This the, the the God that I just got out of a three hour long worship service for is going to condemn people to burn eternally. See, I think that's interesting because I don't think a lot of people sit with that imagery. They don't very often. I think a lot of people are like, "Oh hell yeah, that's difficult." So I'm not gonna like take it in. But there's like so much that like if you really think about. Look into a fire. Look at what it does to a, an object, or or a being, or a person, or a roasted chicken. You know, like yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's yeah. Like dark. you, you, you look at a dark. roasted chicken and watch its its flesh turning into grease and yeah. dripping down. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. and then and and then you think about that for humans. And and how unethical is it for children to to tell kids if you don't have the same black and white thinking that we have then this is going to be the consequences of your actions. Yeah, and I think maybe uh, some of this is compounded with the fact that I was an artistic kid, I was an imaginative kid, I was very in tune with emotions. And so images that maybe other other adults might brush off because they're indoctrinated to or other kids like might not want to go to this unpleasant place. I perseverated on so you you talk about yeah. jesus and you have these images of your skin getting flayed off your back with pre- whips yeah. and pieces of broken glass and having nails hammered into your hands but and i don't think that's to do with you being a constructive or creative kid i think that it was that is the logical extent of yeah. what is being said that's what they want you to, to yeah. do yeah, but I, I don't know that everybody is disturbed by it. And maybe maybe yeah. it's just through like repeated exposure to those images. You you come to not be traumatized by pictures of um, a spear 
being shoved into somebody's side and having it spurt out so much blood that it covers the centurion standing next to it. Like, right, right. You yeah. know, you're, you're just like, oh, yeah. yeah. You, uh, yeah. you know, I was, yeah, uh, listening to your sort of like pre, your questionnaire responses, right? Um, there was a lot of this, the word scared stood out to me uh, because you used it a lot. As a kid, you were familiar with Christian teachings and they scared you. Like whether it was demons, demonic, <laughs> right, right, yeah. When you were, but I, that was something I could relate to. And I, but I was, I was older when that, like, sort of, st- I started to engage in that, like, high school and college. I remember for for a long period of my life, I would leave Psalm ninety one open next to my bed, mm-hmm. and if I woke up feeling, which is, uh, I can't remember the exact passage, but it's like a, a protective psalm. It's like asking for protection, right? It's like a really famous psalm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would like wake up in the middle of the night and like flip on the light and grab it and read it if I felt, you know, scared. Yeah. Right. And this was like a really big thing for you, whether it was it was the hell imagery or use the word unpredictable mm-hmm. uh, when mm-hmm. talking about God. Uh, yeah. Unpack that a little bit. Uh, I just think like in the scriptures, you have uh, two different images of God that are portrayed to you and they don't it it's so funny because it's hard for me to say this uh as somebody that was a christian to say oh these gods don't match up with each other because immediately as soon as you say old testament god god doesn't seem like cool new god he doesn't seem like cool skateboard god in the new testament (laughs) people are like no they're the same he's just he loves justice but like, yeah, yeah, like yeah. christians will immediately right. try to tell you sorry I just, they'll, they'll have they'll have the theological answer of it like well that's because you know jesus came and he you know uh, he extinguished the you know they'll yeah, have like yeah. the answers and all this but let's but, be honest but, there's a disconnect there's, there's a, a disconnect. disconnect between a god that says come into a land kill all the inhabitants because that land belongs to you and yeah. a god that says there is no longer any the male old, or female or Greek or Gentile, but we're all one in Christ. You yeah, know or I mean? even yeah. in the Old Testament, the God that's like beat your uh, shears into or beat beat your spears into shears, plowshares, plowshares, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like Sheer, shears work too. Shears, yeah. Like yeah. where where images where God says like I am a God of peace, like no more shall there be any bloodshed. Right, right. You like there there is so. So you find comfort. You, I found all this comfort in the, the the idea, some some images of God. And then there's a God that keeps himself very distant from uh, the the Israelites by creating a lot of, like, you, you can't come into the temple unless you're clean. Like, a God that says every... Uh, so, yeah, there's disconnects between these two gods. Like, there's a God that says, I love and accept everyone. And then a God that says, you can't come into the temple if you're on your period. Right. Uh, or, yeah, and you yeah. know what that reminds me of, honestly, is like growing up with a lot of people with a mental illness, mm-hmm. I didn't always know what version of that person I was going to get when I had mm-hmm, to approach mm-hmm. them. And so you start to get kind of, you feel like it's your fault if they respond a certain way and you've learned how to like come to them. And so I think I kind of see that with, with God in a lot of ways mm-hmm. too, when I believed in him that, you know, I didn't know which version of him I would be. Yeah. And God, and God kills a lot of people, like strikes yeah. them down. And so I think that's an image that even in the new Testament scared me a lot. A yeah. Sapphira and, 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 and Sapphira yeah. So people. like, I remember there's one specific passage where there's a guy who is carrying the Ark of the Covenant, um, after it's been captured by, by a rival tribe of the Israelites and And he's carrying it back Mm -hmm. um, and it starts to fall out of the cart that he's carrying in it, carrying it in. And he reaches out his hand to keep it from falling and God strikes him dead for making uh, sure that didn't fall. Yeah. And it's funny because even in the Bible, like the follow up to that is that David is then too scared to take the Ark of the Covenant covenant because he's like well this god is a who can't cross him like I I, I, he's like i don't understand why this happened i don't want god to kill me for no reason right um and it's abusive behavior y- yeah and and uh so yeah i was i was i was scared of god because no matter how generous or loving or or kind or fatherly he can be he can also strike people dead for doing the wrong thing. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. 
Uh, I I think a lot about um, this is actually kind of a, this is a has a was a big theme for me leaving the church was God as a as a father right Oh God here we go but God like the God that we're presented with and the God that we experience even as Christians is an absentee abusive father right mm-hmm. I mean like there are days where he's fun dad. And he comes home and he picks you up and swings you around and you go to the zoo and blah, blah, blah. And then there are days where he won't acknowledge that you exist or he... Won't let you know for sure whether he exists. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like literally like we're we're begging for for some kind of interaction, praying, praying, praying. And God's just like, no, you're fine. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. We want a relationship with a father that is willing to sacrifice his own son. Like, like right, we, right. we, we get into yeah, that's like interesting. Jesus gives us his sonship, but we're getting sonship with God that says, uh, I'm willing to kill my own son for your salvation. Right. Or like, telling Abraham that he should kill his. Yeah. And even yeah, though yeah. he changes his mind at the last minute, that's still bizarre oh, that's behavior. abusive behavior yeah, yeah yeah we would like it like uh, the thing that i always say is if god was a real earthly father we would take his kids away yeah we, we would we would literally would like society would say no you're not fit to be a father and they would take your take your kids away and i know that a lot of people are going to hear this that are christians they're going to say well but and and i think this is one of those situations where it's like just please hear us out with an open mind. Like these things don't add up. They don't add up. Yeah. Or even just saying like, this is our experience with it. It doesn't have to be your experience, but this was my experience that I read the Bible and it made me anxious and worryful and uh, Mm -hmm. worried. (laughs) Worryful. It made me anxious. It made me worried. It made me scared. It, but made what, me feel like I was in danger. But what was it that made you feel that way? It was the fact that you wanted to do what was right. You wanted to be the best Christian that you can be. And if you didn't have that motivation, then these things would have just not meant to, much to you, and we'd have been able to overlook them. Does that make sense? Uh, in the I'm sense sure that, that like, I think what made us be worrisome about it. What made us kind of like go through with this anxiety was the fact that we actually cared about what we were believing. Yes. And we actually wanted oh, to be yeah, obedient right, right, and listen right. to it. Right. Um, because the, we, we gave it that, remnant, that thought. As they say. Yeah. Well, and, go and, that and far, then, but... So there's this aspect of like <laughs> wanting to be the best Christian that you can be and then being told you, you can never be the best Christian that you right. can be. Yeah. yeah. Like you, no matter how hard you try, are going to, to fail. Yeah. Um, what I think I'm trying to say is like, we came to these conclusions because we wanted to do what was right. We didn't come to these conclusions because we went to Christianity saying, oh, how can we mess this up for everybody else? Mm-hmm. You know, Ed, I think that was a yeah. big difference for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was kind of one of your first things is that kind of put doubts in your mind is, is, is that as a child. As a child, hearing, I loved God and I wanted to follow him. And then I read the Bible and was didn't want to follow him and was scared by him and felt he was capricious and so what was kind of your next big breaking point then as you got older um i think there was a lot of dissonance that i felt between of a god that is excellent Mm -hmm. and omnipotent and my experience of the world the way that it was i think And this is something that I know a lot of Christians struggle with. They look at something like the Holocaust and say, where was this? Where was the loving God? Seven million people died in torturous conditions. They read uh, Ellie Weisel's um, Night and Mm -hmm. and it's uh, or or, or Spiegelman's Mouse. And and Mm -hmm. they look at it and they say, this is so evil and so sad that my mind cannot comprehend how horrific it is. Like, mm-hmm. like to protect myself, I have to distance myself from what's happening because, um, like, I cannot handle the weight of of um, how horrific it is. And yet, I am still supposed to believe that God saw all of this and this was part of His plan, and that He was loving and that He cared for the people that were tortured that had their children murdered in front of them, that were raped, that were 
put into gas chambers. And, and, and I just, that was a continual struggle that I just never could. Wow. Understand, like justify this God is loving and good. And yet all this bad stuff happens. And, um, yeah. And I think any Christian rhetoric against that was not, um, satisfied. Oh, two things. One is that all of those fears were exacerbated by the church constantly telling me that God is a God that loves and intervenes. So this woman in my church saying the spirit leads her to do everything. She lost her keys. She prayed God would help her find her keys and the spirit of the Lord led her to her keys. And I'm like, why would God do that? Why would God show you where your keys are and let kids be murdered in the yeah. Holocaust? Yeah, yeah. Um, On or, one hand, God is so good. Yeah, or, or that He helped you find your keys. Yes, or, or even for more serious things like God healed this person that was sick. Right, God right. Uh, protected me in an accident, and yeah. and uh, I mean, not even like just talking about the Holocaust. Talking about personal things that had happened, like I was molested by other kids in my church, Mm -hmm. Um, or I had friends that were raped by their stepdads and, and, and feeling like, where is God? Why did he heal this person? Like, like resenting God every time you give him credit for something good, because he didn't intervene in these Mm -hmm. very personalist situations. So I I don't really talk about this too often, Um, but that's, that's literally what my breaking point was for leaving Christianity. Um, I, I don't, have I even talked about that on the show, Chuck? I'm trying to remember. I tried to keep it quiet of why, what my last thing was. I think what I talk about was that the church excommunicated me and I got time to stop and think about my doubts and to really reflect on those. But my main one was this, is if God is at all places at all time, if he's able to create the world in six days, got the power of creating an entire universe just by the, the voice of his mouth. Um, and and yet he is at all places, all times, see these horrible things happening to innocent children. And he sits by and, and passively allows it to happen. If I was in a situation where I was passively watching anybody get hurt, murdered, molested, raped, whatever, mm-hmm. um, and I just sat there and allowed it, yeah. um, I would be a horrible, horrible person. Well, you would be an assailant in a crime. I, and be saying, <laughs> but I'm literally. an accomplice. An accomplice. Uh, an but I'm limited. Yeah, yeah. I'm limited only to the power that I have as, as Brady Harden, as, as a man who's sitting right here i don't have the power of the universe and i'm not at all places all times right um and yeah we we they're gonna have the answers of like well you know god allows bad things to happen or he's gonna have free will or if you made it too obvious that he was real then you know people would convert to him and they wouldn't actually mean it it wouldn't be as meaningful to god you know because they're not really having to choose you know what i mean like it's all these different things yes like another big thing i didn't mean to cut you off but the fact that all those rules matter to him more than what should right yeah that says something about that I could not get over him personally with my faith. Yeah. And the other, the other rhetoric that I hear a lot is just to, to silence that doubt. It's you can't know the purposes of God. I mean, this is what happens in Job. Like the entire book of Job is Job being like, this is not fair God that this happened to me. And then the conclusion, the epic conclusion is you're mortal. You can't know what my plans are. God is and literally it, sarcastic in that book. Yeah. And, Where were you at the foundations of the earth? Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and it's so unsatisfying to say I have this real struggle and to be told yes. by the people. And, and, and it's an emotional struggle. It's deeply emotional. And to be told, well, there's no answer for that. And, right. and, and I think that answer also sort of shames you for asking the question because they're like, wow, Who, are yeah. you trying to be God? I think you're right. Yeah, yeah I think you're very right. Um, the, and I don't think that like people with those sort of cookie cutter answers, it's not like, have you ever met somebody that uh, was molested repeatedly as a child? Like, have you ever met somebody? Are they, are they fine? Like, are they okay? You know what I mean? Like, yes, they are, but they've overcome like, you know, extreme difficulties to even survive into adulthood. Right. Right. And they still confront, have nightmares. They confront this regularly and they have to live with this for the rest of their life. And then you have like, people with relatively comfortable stories with some struggles because everybody has them, but they're saying like, well, suffering is just X, Y, and Z and it's part of God's plan. It's and it's like, and you have no idea what right. some people have no been clue. through. Right. Um, we are going to take a quick break. Okay, cool. Um, 
Nein, I need a break. <laughs> <laughs> need to decompress. <laughs> <laughs> when we get back, there. when we get back, we're gonna uh, we're gonna recompress Renee. Do you have a story you want to tell us, or a question you want answered? Do you need advice on how to handle family members who are upset at you because you're wrestling with your beliefs or leaving your religion? Have you experienced some weird religious shit that you need to tell people that might actually get it? Then contact us. Go to thelifeafter.org, all one word, and click the contact us page. Or Facebook us at facebook.com backslash the life after org. Or email us at info at the life after dot org. We would love to hear, hear from. Uh, let's do it together. Okay. One, two, three. We'd, We'd love, love to, to hear, hear from, from you. you. Or when you email us, send us a voice recording. We really like that too. Welcome back to the life after. This is Brady. Um, with each one of our guests, we like to give them little questionnaires, and they send us back the answers to these questionnaires. Sometimes with voice recordings. Today, Renee, I took a walk with your voice recordings, um, which is really bizarre. Oh, by my the voice way. was in your head. It's really bizarre. Did it give you flashbacks to Christianity? <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense in just one it moment it mostly just gives me flashbacks to drew barrymore films i know yeah who do people say you look like or sounds like people say i sound like drew barrymore i had one friend tell me that when i talked they like to close their eyes and imagine whatever i was saying was drew barrymore talking to them oh, wow. <laughs> see i get i get gabby hoffman you sound like gabby hoffman to me okay and i love her so it's worth do you want me to say like i guess we can, um, in a different segment, like look up something Drew Barrymore or Gabby Hoffman would say, and I can say that. Yes. Say that, uh, Stay tuned say for segment for three. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah, we're going to do it. <laughs> Moving we're going to do it. <laughs> uh, but while I was listening to your recordings, there's one thing specifically that I listened to that uh, resonated so much with my own thinking and how I used to be as a Christian. And that was, um, you feel now that you are free to have your own thoughts and to be alone in your thoughts for probably the first time in your life. Yeah. How does that feel? It feels relieving. <laughs> Describe that to us. Like, what is and the process there? What was that like? So there's um, some different things going on there. One, I think you're taught as a Christian that God can read your thoughts. And so mm. you constantly, no matter what you're thinking, if it's good, bad, neither, mundane, if it's like, oh, it's time for me to get groceries. Th there was a part of me in the back of thinking it's time to get groceries that thinks God just heard me say it's time to get groceries. If, if I thought something bad, I would feel ashamed that uh, somebody was watching me say this. If I'm working through emotions, I, I, I am aware that somebody else is uh, watching me have these emotions. Um, if I feel, if I think something, I, I think I would try sometimes when I thought bad thoughts to immediately think something good to compensate for the fact wow. that I had said something. It's like, um, like if you energy. accidentally cuss in front of a kid, you're like, shit. And then you're like, oh, sh sh shoot, checks. Right. Like that's what I did with God. Like, yeah. cause, but, but cause I have to compensate for having the wrong thought. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it's not even like somebody's aware of your thoughts. It's like they're intimately aware of your being as much as you are. Right? Yes, and it's somebody that... It's invasive. Yes, it's invasive. And it's also somebody that is judging your thoughts. Right. So your thoughts are constantly right. being judged. Um, it's like when you're at work and you're being micromanaged by a boss. Mm -hmm. You know, your performance is going to go down because you're constantly on edge and it's like feel like every single thing that you do or say is going to be scrutinized or judged. And I think that the other thing that is going along with that is that in Christian teaching, you're taught that your thoughts are the same as your actions. So if you think an angry thought about someone, it's the same as murdering them. If you lust... I mean, that's after, a, it's in the Bible. Yeah, that's in if the Bible. you lust after someone, it's the same as having sex with them. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, and... Which both of those are taught in the Sermon on the Mount, like Sermon on the Mount, explicitly, yeah, yeah. like you directly said. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of freedom to know my thoughts don't equal my actions, especially if I'm angry with someone and working through that anger. I think so, part of the the process of that is to yes. allow yourself to 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 be to enact revenge in your mind before you can calm down and say, "Let's look." At least for me, to to say. 
I, I'm angry at them, but let's look about this uh, at this in another way, but allow myself to feel fully the extent of my anger. And then also that, I mean, some, some thoughts also, because you're taught that they're the same as the action. Um, uh, like I no longer have to police being attracted to people. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I, I have freedom to feel sexual attraction for people. And, uh, I think that is relieving. It's relieving to find women attractive and not to feel ashamed for that. It's, um, and it's funny because like, like in the Bible, you're told like, yeah, like, well, you're sorry. (laughs) Having sex isn't wrong. I don't, I do not think having sex consensual sex outside of marriage with a partner that is of age is mm-hmm. wrong right like the consenting might, partner yeah yeah i mean maybe in some circumstances circumstances it might be wrong for you emotionally or whatever sure. but yeah, yeah. um i think that i think that is a huge part of the way the church controls people is telling you your sexuality is wrong and and Um, because there's so much in the Bible that we can, like, if you look at the 10 commandments, those are easy to follow. It's, it's hard not to lie, but you can get by in life without lying. It's hard not to covet, but you can not covet. It's hard not to commit adultery. I mean, it's not hard to, not to commit adultery. That's like, I'm not going to murder someone. I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to commit adultery. So you can have a list of rules that you can follow, but then when you're told you can't think someone's hot. Right. Because that's the same thing as being sexually attracted to them, which is lusting. So you can't think someone's hot. Then you immediately have to repent to God. And that creates this need for God. Yes. Thought policing creates a need for God uh, that doesn't otherwise exist. Because if you have to be forgiven for your thoughts, not your actions, then Mm -hmm. you have to continually go back and seek forgiveness and favor from God. Right. You can go a full day without violating any of the Ten Commandments in action, right? But you can't go 10 minutes without violating them in thought. Right. Yeah. But it, I, the way that you describe this and the way that I understood it as well, it's, it's almost like a horror movie that you're never alone, that there's always somebody there that mm-hmm. is controlling mm-hmm. you and judging you. I know and what you did last summer. Making you feel like a bad person or feeling ashamed for just mm-hmm. being human. Yeah. I mean, going back to like my, my dissonance in childhood with some teachings, I remember every time I went to the bathroom, I was like, man, why is God got to watch me pee? Wow, yeah, yeah. Like God's watching me. Well, you know what's funny is, you know what's, you know what's funny is, okay, so there are sins of commission and sins of omission, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So commission would be like you're you lust or you commit adultery or something that you committed a sin. Omission is like you omit to do something, so you're not you're not giving money to the poor, or you're not doing whatever you're not doing x y and z that you've been commanded to do right but there's no oh, i'm so sorry let it out yeah. let it you out you need to start that over you can i'm, no, was, I'm drinking wine that's staying in there uh, we're drinking wine yeah um but there's no way you can't handle it <laughs> this is why this is my favorite episode for sure um so but there's no like you can't think something good and it work. Yeah. <laughs> you have to do it. Like you can't just think you can't just think I I really hope that that person, that homeless person gets a meal tonight and that well, I'm going to send them my prayers and thoughts. Right? It doesn't go that way. Right. But if it's a bad thing, oh boy, <laughs> it heard. counts. Yeah. You've committed murder cuz you hate that person, but if you consciously love that person that doesn't you haven't done enough yeah. right you know yeah those those teachings are so extreme and i think that because we're taught them when we were younger they just seem to oh these are normal right but really when you when you get older and you stop and think about the fact that none of your thoughts are your own or that you are constantly being patrolled by big brother um it can really mess you up mentally and mess you up emotionally yeah. and psychologically and i mean i think the difficulty is is there, there's not it's not entirely untrue that your thoughts have an effect on your actions. Right. Like that it is true that, um, you know, if, if I, I constantly dwell on how angry I am at somebody that I might 
act out in ang- anger. But I think that it, it just like as a non-Christian, I have a more sophisticated view of that. I understand right. that it's nuanced. Yeah, that there's nuance that one, my thoughts might affect my actions, but they are not conflated with my, they are not the same things as my actions. Right. And I think especially with attraction, because there's some tons of people that I can feel attracted for, like, um, and not, not bang. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think like in a relationship, I'm in a committed monogamous relationship and I am attracted to other people and I have that as a passing thought and yeah. then I'm like, yeah, but I'm happy in this partnership. I'm not going to pursue well, that. But yeah. I, yeah. And also like there's, you know, there are two people involved in a sexual encounter, yeah. not just you, yeah. right? Like, so there's, there's this assumption that it's almost, it's probably a little bit patriarchal, if not very patriarchal. This assumption that if you Wait. listen, no, 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 <laughs> I'm not saying that the Bible's patriarchal. Don't, no, no, I'm kidding. But not at all. But there's this like, oh, if you lust after a woman, it's like you're having sex with her because she would definitely not say no. You know, like. <laughs> but no, I think also it 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 creates so much more unnecessary problems within marriages where, you know, if you find out that the man looked at pornography or the man like wandered his eyes at another woman or whatever, then there's this feeling of like, well, no, you committed adultery in the heart, you know, all this different stuff. And so it gets blown out of proportion. So my, my experience with that is a little bit different is I completely agree with what you say. But one of the big things that stood out to me is the fact that I, I can allow myself to be angry and hate people. Um, and my hate looks different. It's not like I'm constantly dwelling on it, but I allow myself to just not like certain people and be okay with that if their actions deserve that. I judge people on their actions and the words that they say. If they do something that I find um, immoral or wrong, um, I'm not going to continually throw myself at their mercy and say, you know, hey, please come back in my life. Let's work this out. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm allowed to just be like, no, nope. no, like no, sorry. you've had enough chances. Yeah, what you, what you do is deserving. And I, of my I'm hatred. not, in fact, doing this out of love. I just think you're a shitty person. I just think you're a bad person. Yeah, and yeah. and for me to say that I hate them doesn't mean that I'm dwelling on it and it's burning or I've got bitterness inside but it, it, of me. It's like having the freedom to say what they did to me was wrong, and I'm going to acknowledge that. Yes, right. I'm yeah. not just going to forgive it and and throw myself to where I can be hurt by them again. I happen to have a poem. I know you right she, pulled up listener she got really excited when I started about yeah, hatred yeah. I had this she, huge smile because I was uh, I'm yeah, reading this, should, this one episode should be a video podcast I'm reading Sherman Alexie's uh, memoir you don't have to say you love me if you don't know Sherman Alexie what's wrong with you go out and read the Lone Ranger and Tonto fist fight in heaven <laughs> um um but what? so I'm reading his. Okay, go ahead. So what? I'm, I'm reading this memoir and he has a poem, and it was so resonant with me that I took a photograph of it and and look at it. Um, Let's hear it. Uh, so it's called the No. Okay. So like we N-O? must. Yes, the okay. No. All right. Uh, this is by Sherman Alexi, noted <laughs> author and poet. <laughs> so we must forgive all those who trespassed against us. Fuck that shit. I'm not some charitable trust. There are people I will hate even after I'm ashes and dust. Wow. Dang. And and so like we have this idea that hatred hatred means that we want them dead because that's what the Bible says. We want to murder them. We want to do all this. But really, I think that sometimes we're just allowed to be angry and know, hey, somebody's character is not up to par to what we feel it should be. So we are going to choose not to be around that person and be okay with not yeah. In one way, do I love them? Yes, I love them in one way as a human loves anybody. Amen. But also, I hate them in a way that one human can hate another person. Right. They can change in the future. I'm not closing that door. Yeah. Yeah. But listen to but, me. I'm but, like backtracking everything I'm say, saying. You, because can, no, it's you like, can say they can change in the tr- future. I'm not closing that door. But maybe the wrong that has been done against me is so egregious that I have to protect myself from the hurt of that and it no is, matter what. Listeners, it is okay to do that protect yourself right it's okay you have permission and i'm hearing you also say that you gave your we talk about this all the time like if we had to rename this podcast it could be called giving yourself permission yeah yeah because you have to be able to give yourself permission to question these things to uh to evict god from your mind and be okay with not having his minds patrolling everything you say and do what is your freedom like now um, that you have gotten away from that? Like, how has your thought process changed, do you think? Mm. 
I kind of feel like she already answered that. Did she? Um, let me ask a different question then. Y- do you? Yeah, I mean, I just oh. th- I think that it's just I feel relieved. I feel a re- relieved to have the privacy of my thoughts. Uh, I, I feel, love that phrase, privacy of your thoughts. Yes. Yeah, I feel relieved to to be alone with my thoughts, to parse through them, to have them to myself, to not feel the invasion of somebody else coming yes. in and listening to them and judging them. Right. So I've always had bullies in my life, like people that if I dress a certain way, I, I filter it through, well, how is this person going to think? About Brady, me? I'm sorry that I make fun of the way you dress sometimes. Not you. No, I love the way you dress. But... <laughs> No, no matter what, I've always had those like those loud bullies in my life, and they get in my mind. Mm-hmm. And so then I still filter my my thoughts and my actions through that. Whenever I'm working out and I'm doing cardio and I'm like on the, the the elliptical by myself, I love to listen to music and like go into this. And I love to create music videos inside of my mind. But what I do is I stop myself at times because I'm like, what if somebody finds out that I do this? It could be really weird if somebody walked in right now and mm-hmm. saw what I'm thinking oh, of yeah. like what I'm creating in my mind. Right. And, and it comes back to this idea that we still filter our thoughts to like these bullies in our lives. And I think for a lot of us, God was this bully. And I've had mm. to like step back and give myself permission to be like, wow. uh, no, oh, like, really can you uh, give I can me just... some more wine, please? <laughs> <laughs> I like to just now, now like realize, no, I'm another, alone. We're, we're going to take a quick break and open another bottle. <laughs> <laughs> we do need to take a break. In a minute. But I mean, just giving myself permission to have these like, yeah, these thoughts, these very in-depth things that beforehand, I think I would be embarrassed by. If somebody found out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. With that we said, actually are going to take a quick break to go get some more wine. Yeah. And, and when we get back, we will have wine. And to doo-doo. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do this episode. <laughs> what is that? I'm calling it a... Grrr. It's a new letter I've been working on. You're right, Chuck. We've always had 26, but I think we could really benefit from having 27. Oh... Brady, I asked you to make a newsletter, not a new letter. Oh. Like we could put a link on our website and have listeners sign up to receive an email newsletter whenever we have updates? Exactly like that. Yeah, okay, I I could get that ready by the time we release this. Sounds great. Sign up for the newsletter at (laughs) thelifeafter.org. But I slur the word cognizant. (laughs) Cognizant. Cognizant. Welcome back to the life after. Welcome back, um, Renee. I want to hear how your decision making now as a adult who's gotten away from Christianity. How has that changed? Yeah. Um, who? <laughs> sorry, I just. This is another aspect of leaving Christianity that has been really uh, relieving for me. Mm-hmm. When I was a Christian, um, I struggled with depression a lot and I still struggle a lot with depression, anxiety. And I think there was a lot of struggle in Christianity that I would pray for God to change me. I would have these things that I struggled with over and over again and and asked, God change this, God change this, God change this. And it never changed. And so I felt one, like, God was testing me or ignoring me or being cruel to me. And then two, like I'm still dealing with these things that never change. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was still a Christian, I had, I lived in South Korea for a while and I moved back from South Korea. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. And, and so I moved back from Seoul and it was one of the lowest points in my life. I went from, having a job teaching English in a school and having a lot of mobility because Seoul has wonderful socialist public transportation and um, uh, and I have it feeling like I had a sense of purpose for my life and living on my own to living with my parents, having no driver's license and like being claustrophobic and stuck in my house and not having a job because it was 2010 and the recession had hit. And mm-hmm. so just, just feeling trapped in every way and somewhere in the middle of that depression I was like that you know I'm sad and there's ways that I can manage this so let's look at the list of the reasons that I'm sad 
and see if there are some things I can change. I, I am sedentary, so I started running. Um, uh, and then I uh, needed an outlet to talk about my sadness, so I started a blog. And mm-hmm. I looked for a job and found a job, and I moved out of my parents' house. And and all of those things were... And, and I realized while I was doing wow. that, like, I didn't want to give God credit for it. Because these were all decisions that I had made on my own, that I had analyzed my life and said, what can I do to change this? I feel so trapped. I'm so sad. What can I change in my circumstances? Mm -hmm. And I changed it. And it felt frustrating for me as someone who had kept praying for God to make me happy and never being happy Mm -hmm. to have to give him credit for it. And, And I know that some people say things like God helps those who help themselves, but that is not a Bible verse. Right. And in my denomination, they were like, no, that's not true. How do you know that God wasn't using your thought process to help you? I mean, I guess I don't, I I couldn't prove that God wasn't using my thought process to help me, but, um, but I couldn't prove that I couldn't prove that he was or wasn't using that right and exactly. i was the one that was doing all the leg work oh, yeah yeah so like so why like so god didn't like I, manipulate my legs into right. arduously running every morning right. but that's like a that's like a common <laughs> counter argument right the, anytime the, the that, you, anytime is that, that you, you're like i did something christians are like well but god I didn't, did it god, if you he, get into god super you, technicality didn't, didn't god put you you prayed for 17 years for your depression to to heal yeah. and then god finally in his in his he time created... he gave you but it's like no you made a cognitive decision on your own to move he right? created yeah. the ingredients of the power bar that you're eating to be able to go run right you know <laughs> right. yeah but it's funny because we actually had to talk about that on when i was picking you up mm-hmm. um was I mean, I don't want to brag, but you said, you know, I'm looking pretty swole nowadays. Whatever. Um, Thank so you this much. is a radio show. So yeah. You cannot we'll see, see how him. sexy Brady yeah. looks. Why don't He's you flexing. describe it for a minute? <laughs> <laughs> but no, there is. But for me, my story was that, you know, at the beginning of this year, I had a situation where I stood up to my family and I've always come from a family that seems to be victims of their circumstances. And after I stood up to them, I realized, oh, like I can actually do something about dealing with it, being overweight for my depression and mm-hmm, actually go mm-hmm, to the gym mm-hmm. and do these different things. So I've been able to take that back into my own power and uh, kind of been the captain of my own ship in that way. And that was mm-hmm. something I was never really comfortable with doing before I left the faith. Yeah. 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 That's it's, uh, it's empowering. It is empowering. It's, I mean, in a way that it's hard to describe to people that are in the faith. But I mean, yeah. as Christians, we never thought that, oh, you just pray and you don't do anything about it. But there was still this reliance and this um, like victimization that we would yeah. have by our circumstances mm-hmm. because yeah. we saw them as, well, this is God's will for me to be in this really difficult situation. So it's harder to really look at it from the same gumption of getting out whenever you realize, whenever you believe that God is the one who puts you in there. Yeah. And, and, and then you also, like, it is hard to not have your prayers answered. So. Yes. Now I don't feel like maybe I try to change my circumstances and I still have an underlying sadness and I can examine that sadness and feel it and look at it and, and not say, well, why, why is God making me feel like, why, why doesn't he care? You're right. Like, like well, I, it really, I, I don't, it contributes I don't have to your this, depression. It does contribute to your it, depression. I mean, tremendously. Yeah. Yeah, I I've I've been in the most depressed I've ever been was was the was the after effects of this in this period of my life where I very intensely believed that I was that God was giving me direction and I was following it mm-hmm. followed by a long period of time where I felt like God was not giving me anything at all and I was severely depressed. I mean very very debilitatingly depressed. And it's hard whenever we feel like God's leading us to different places because we have to make in our lives, we make choices every day. Am I going to do this? I'm going to do that. And mm-hmm. We feel like, well, God is in one of those decisions, but he's not in the other decisions. Yeah. Yes. And that was another aspect of Christianity that has been freed up for me a lot is that um, I thought there were right and wrong decisions. Right. And, um, and or that, that there were paths that God wanted me mm-hmm. to follow. And now 
I feel like there's decisions you can make and those decisions have positive effects and negative effects and um and that's just how it is yeah. Some, one of them yeah, yeah. so f- I just moved to Boston and it was an incredibly excruciating process for me to decide whether or not to leave St. Louis because yeah. this is my home and I love it and and then on the it other hand it was excruciating for me too <laughs> <laughs> but there was not a right or wrong decision if I had stayed in St. Louis there would have been, uh, uh, like I would have been able to have continued interactions with my friends group here, which I value. I would have had a job that I really liked that I felt, um, uh, yeah, that, that, that my talents were being put to use. Um, but I would have been apart from the, this relationship and a partner that I am, um, interested in pursuing. And I mean, Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there wasn't a right or wrong cho- choice. There was just a choice. Mm-hmm. And I I looked at those choices and made a choice. And I think when I was in Christianity, there was a lot more weight to whatever choice I made and a lot of praying for guidance, for directions and 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 worrying that I had strayed from God's path or that I or feeling even confident that I had followed God's path, but then being confused when things were frustrating. Where they would go wrong. Yeah, when they would would feel for me, like this goes a lot in relationships Mm -hmm. that I I felt like, well, God is leading me to be with this person. Mm -hmm. And then if I go and I pursue that and then it goes badly then I felt shamed that... That you had misinterpreted what God was leading you to do. Yes, and so it wasn't just like, oh, there was a breakup, it was, or a divorce, it was like, oh, there's a breakup and a divorce, and obviously I cannot be trusted with understanding God because I'm going to make the wrong decisions. Or like, I did something to mess this up, and this was God's plan, and now I've deviated from it, which is worse, more shame. But what I think it's so dangerous for us to constantly walk in every single situation in our life thinking, okay, well, what is it there God's is trying right to teach us? Answer. What is God trying to teach yes. us? What what character are we in this fable? Are we, you know, right. are we the, the 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 rabbit that runs too fast? Or are we the, the, the turtle? Are, are, we so, it's, yeah, like, it's, are we Noah? Yeah, are we Noah? Are we the whale being taught that I should have made a different choice? Yeah, yeah, and I always would try oh, to yeah, like... Yeah. What did I call him? No. I said Noah, sorry. I know the Bible. Yeah. Hashtag Jesus. But it's like we'd always have, we'd always be trying to interpret these things as if our life were one of these figurative stories that was in the Bible. Yeah. And so, because we were taught with this black and white thing, mm-hmm. we would try to look at our lives also in this black and white. And I think that um, we're giving ourselves permission to walk away from that and say, no, I'm going to make a decision. Good's going to come out of it, bad's going to come out of it. But you know what? That's how life is. Right. And we have to be okay with that yeah. instead of trying yeah. to over spiritualize it. Mm-hmm. Cause and effect is so much more. Well, it was always weird to me that, like, like your finances, right? You. You use cause and effect to man, to understand and manipulate your finances. If I work, I will make money. If, if I, I didn't have a kid, much, I would have money. Right. <laughs> if I work this much, I will have this much money. If I have this much money, I can spend this much money on this thing and this thing and this thing. And it's like, that's how life works with everything, right? If yeah. I need to dig a hole, I need a shovel and I need dirt and I need a place. You know what I mean? It's like, we use our reason and our cause and effect understanding for everything. But then when it comes to God, for some reason, you're just supposed to throw all that out. And just be like, well, I don't know. God he is could, like teaching me something. Who knows what his plan may be? Who knows what his plan is? And suddenly it's like there's no sense of, so you're looking for this plan, but you're not using the tools that you usually use to make a plan. Do, yeah. you, do you guys think that there was a time that you made a decision based on what you thought God wanted you to do and um, you regret it now? Like you wouldn't have made this decision were it not for... I don't know if you know this, but I was married before. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but I was married. <laughs> also, you're, you're the first guest to ask us a question. I like that. <laughs> that's deep. Yeah. What, what the <laughs> hell is this? I don't even remember what the question was. I was like, oh, she's asking us. Oh, something. God. Somebody, we just ask questions call, and if they answer them. Call Bob from writing. We need, we need something. Because <laughs> I, I feel like a little bit um, my choice in career was based on... Uh, so I, I was in education for two years yeah. and it was the most, oh, I was, I was, let's rephrase that. I was in education in a 
poor inner city school. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that decision was based on feeling like I needed to do something self-sacrificial. Yeah. Um, I needed to, to, um, oh yeah, just, um, serve the poor. I mean, yeah. it, sound, it sounds, I feel embarrassed saying it because I think when I um, articulate some of the reasons, they now sound a little bit imperialistic or white, no, white yeah, savory. But, right, right. But, yeah, of course. But, what, white it, it saviorism in church? <laughs> anyway. It does. It doesn't really go do, do me any good to go back to the past and say, um, you know, what could have happened differently because what happened happened. But I do think that were I not a Christian, I would not have gone into education. I would have gone into something that was uh, something that I enjoyed and thought I was good at. More strategic, something that you're going to enjoy that would yeah, create cause I, more I, 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 I was an actress, uh, and I am yeah. still, like, I, I perform in local theater and independent film. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of, I remember having thought processes where I thought, well, I can become an actress and then mm -hmm. thinking um, that that was self selfish, self-serving. Self self yes. And, and I, I'm not saying that every Christian thinks that way. I think right. that there are some people that, that um, sort of will say, you know, I'm, I'm using my talents to serve the Lord, but, but for me, what I wanted to do um wasn't important. What was important to me was what God wanted me to do. And, um, and I think I made a lot of decisions, uh, n negatively about what I wanted to do because I believed mm -hmm. that God wanted me to do something different. Right. And, um, and those decisions still have implications Lasting for effects. me yes. now. Well, I mean, my degree... Oh, my yeah, this de is huge. My degree is in biblical studies right. and theology, and huge. I identify as an atheist yeah. now. And so, like, career-wise, I'm very much at a handicap because... I would I, say that between the ages of 17 and 25, mm -hmm. probably almost every decision I made was problematic in that way. Every major life decision that I made was problematic in that way. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm it, there's a sense to which I'm... Like, not just... I mean, jobs, you know, purchases, moves, uh, you know, all kinds of shit. And I feel like... When I, like the day that I stopped being a Christian was day one for me in a lot of ways. You know, it was like, mm -hmm. oh, was the first this, day is, of your life? this is where my life starts. This is the first, first day, day of, of my life. life. Oh, I was doing a RuPaul <laughs> thing. You guys were all doing something Oh, else. yeah, no, no, no. Bright eyes. Con Conor Conor Roberts, Roberts, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Straight okay. people. No, Conor Roberts. Well, Robert and whatever you, <laughs> whatever you are. Conor Roberts does have... <laughs> A, cultured people brady no mm. Mm. i will say connor connor oberst was oh, like one of those sources that was influential in like <laughs> leading me away from christianity yeah rupaul was too <laughs> yeah um no but, but it's, yeah, it's a no, good point I mean, that is that is m massive and that's that's one of the big biggest things that i think people that listen to this show have to work through and undo work on is like a useless degree or the decision not to go to college because you wanted to pursue a ministry. Mm -hmm. Well, the way or that we the always decision to stay in a city because of this church that you were a part of that was doing a thing mm -hmm. that, you know, and it's like never asking the question, what do I want? What am I good at? What are my talents? What brings me fulfillment? Yeah, and that and doesn't just... necessarily mean being selfish. Like like I talked no, about moving to Boston all. and a consideration in that was as a matter of... you know, what will this do for my partner if yeah. we're apart? Like how will my decisions, affect? like, it's not just about me, but I'm not bringing in a God that cannot actually reveal to me right. what he yes. wants. Yes, because we're, we're legitimately making all these decisions for a God who found it more important to not show himself to us or prove his existence, but to keep this other thing going of like where we had to question whether or not he was real right. so that whenever we did choose him, it would feel it would be better for him. So it's right. like, yes, it's insane that we Jeez. made these decisions on that. On a hypothesis, it's like a gamble. I would but even like argue <laughs> that, like, as far as like whether or not it's selfish, I think that doing what you love gives you the capacity to give to other people, to yes. give things to other people, because Absolutely. you feel fulfilled, you feel full of life, and you have something to give Absolutely. instead of being exhausted and having nothing and just trying to squeeze out 
you know. Well, when I was trying to brand like this podcast and everything, for the longest time, I would say, you know, this is a podcast about starting over after leaving religious trauma mm-hmm. or, or a toxic religious environment. Yeah. I think I've kind of changed it now to this is about the life after doing that. Um, because I, I don't want it to seem that we are completely changing over. In a lot of ways, we are because our, com- our complete mindsets and everything have changed. Yeah. But now it's like, I just want to focus on that that life and that there are some things that we are able to pick up and keep on going with um, that we're able to transfer. So it's not completely starting over, but let's be honest. It, it really is so much like we completely started over. Like you said, it, oh, yeah. that day was like day one. It is. It was day one. I mean, day I still think of you. it that way. It was day one. Renee, let me ask you this though. What do you know now as Renee 2017 um, that you would go back and tell yourself when you were in this and, these times where you're making decisions for the God that you were following instead of for yourself, what would you tell yourself? Um, I, I think being who I am now, um, I versus who I was, I, I would go back and tell myself, don't be waiting for someone else to change you. Look at your life and examine it and see what you can change and change as much as you can. And you are the one that's going to do that. You are capable of doing it. Um, I would tell myself, I think a lot of the, the shame that I had internalized, I would tell myself, you are not an innately bad person. You are kind. You are loving. Mm. You are compassionate. You have the capacity to do good. You are not a massa Picotti. You are not in, uh, totally depraved. Right. You yeah. are not like I, I would I would comfort myself and just just um, tell myself. You do you, you make mistakes and you do bad things. You hurt other people, but you yourself, who your nature is, is not bad. Mm. And, That's huge. Um, yeah. And then I I'd tell myself I was capable of making change um, and that. Yeah, I should I should look at my life, look at what I wanted and pursue those things. Um, and then I'd also tell myself that uh, like having sex is not that big of a deal. Right. I had a conversation this week actually with somebody who we were talking about the effects of sexuality, <laughs> like hookup culture or like being more sex positive. Right. right. And um, they were a Christian and their response was, well, I wonder, you know, if they've ever looked at how bad it is to have hookups, like how much it messes you up. And I think that a lot of times the reason it messes you up mentally or psychologically is because, because you're told. you already believe that it's going to mess you up. You're told that it's going to mess you up and, yeah. and that, that if you, you're going to give yourself. Oh yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, it just doesn't mess you up. I mean, sometimes it does because you made a bad decision or like you hurt somebody or like you or hurt like in yourself. the context of a relationship, the whole right. relationship is messed up for other reasons. Are, but it's the context that makes it. It's bad. the it's it's doing? yeah yeah no it's just being very conscious of what you want and need sexually yeah. in responding to that. It's not like I'm gonna go bang. Like I mean, you know, you can get lost. You can lose yourself in 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 any powerful force. and have good communication with yourself and yeah. with the other person. Yeah. I think that's where it goes. So through. I oh sorry yeah I just I remember the first time I had sex. Um, I had left the faith. I mean, honestly, that was like part of why I left the faith because I was horny. Right. And uh, like in the, in the, some Christians, hashtag not all Christians, some, some religions are a lot more sex positive than um, yes. the Presbyterian Church of America, PCA. But, um, <laughs> but anyways, like the, the first time I, I had sex, um, it was fun. It was kind of brief it was <laughs> <laughs> it was like brief uh, it was, and what it was like, his name no i'm not no 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 it was it was it was um like it, it it yeah it was it was messy and sweet and yeah. and fun and yeah and I got done, and I think even as a non-Christian, I was like thinking that I would feel changed, and nothing was different. I was just like, "Oh, I've like, okay, right, cool." I, I yeah, had yeah. an experience. It, it like, like virginity is the only thing that we define. Like, it's the only thing that we define as like. There's no other words that we have to describe something you haven't done. Like, yeah, if you've uh, never been yeah. to. 
a yeah, yeah. a amusement park. We don't have a, a word for like. That's why we always say like, oh, we're breaking your amusement park virginity. Yeah, because yeah. there's not. You're not defined by what you haven't done. You're yes, defined by what you really do. Bizarre Remind idea. me yeah. never to go to Six Flags with you. That was that was uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> that was so uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. But like. Like the first time you go to Six Flags, you're not like, wow, I'm changed as a person. You're like, I had an experience that was fun. Maybe it was bad. Maybe you got sunburned, overpriced. You were in line yeah. for too long, but you're not like. Too many people in uh, costumes. You have just had an experience. Yeah. And and, and, are... and then you're the same person, but with a different experience. Yes. Um, Let me ask you this then. Um, so we talked about the, the messages that you would like to have changed from this side to your previous life. But what messages, what things are you happy carry o- carried over from your previous life to this one? Yeah, that's a that's actually a good question. I think... Um, Thank you. I existed in a... Uh, the church that I went to existed sort of in a, a weird microcosm in, in terms of... Uh, like in broader evangelical Christianity, this church sort of stood apart in that they were very socially just. They they cared a lot about um, racial equality and al- alleviating some of the uh, the the burdens that uh, poor people have. And yeah, like they 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 had a ton of ministries to refugees and immigrants and. Um, kids that were in the public schools yeah. and and uh homeless and um part of the reason that I stayed in Christianity so long was that I believed that the work that my church was doing was good and I, mm-hmm. and I, I still believe that and um my parents are also people that uh sort of gave up their life for ministry and gave up their life to um to to make the world a more just place. They are Mm -hmm. like merciful and compassionate. And I I kept thinking like, maybe there's something wrong with me because I I do want the world to be just and merciful and peaceful. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe I can stay in Christianity because I think these values are good with out having any of the accoutrements and the bad stuff in it but right. eventually right. like i just said you know what i cannot be in this religion anymore but i can try to take these good things that were instilled in me in terms of trying to address the world's injustices um mm-hmm. and do and and it is kind of funny because some of the ways that that live lives out now are a little bit in contrast to to the church like i think the church instilled me with not not every single church but the church culture that i grew up in the evangelical christianity my church instilled me with uh compassion and you know wanting to seek justice and um now to me that looks like being involved with black lives that matter movement uh-huh. and my church is you know most churches don't agree with that right. or to me that means like being anti-war right. and, and that's because of of teachings that i got from christianity but the church is not necessarily at the at the same place i don't know it's confusing it's kind of like there those interests overlapped and those passions overlapped between church people and people who are not in church that are just socially minded but because of the way we were brought up it was almost as if we felt that that overlap only existed on one side, that it only existed on the side of people who were Christians. And so we felt like we couldn't really do that outside of Christianity. But I think what a lot of us are discovering is um, even more of a freedom and even more of a effectability or an effectiveness um, to do care about these other issues even more effectively now than we did whenever we felt like we had to add in the third right. character it's of, sort well, of how like does this what, go back to God? It's sort of like on the Caleb episode where he was like, Yes. And here's a sandwich and here's a little Jesus, you know? And it's like, well, Or you can just give him a sandwich. Just give him a sandwich. Yeah. Renee, I want to thank you so much for coming. Oh, um, shucks. All the way from Boston. 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 Sorry, Stay in the car, Mickey. <laughs> My accents are so bad. You know what? I mean, that's the only thing I can can say. Tell all of your friends about this podcast because you know what? I'm really intrigued by, as somebody who's not experienced it, I'm really intrigued by um, people who came from the same background I did, but in a big city. 
because my stuff is like I think can only exist a lot of times in very small communities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but I'm mm-hmm, more mm-hmm. interested. Like, but we loved like Tim Keller, who was like a big writer and everything, who was a pastor of yeah. a big church in the city. I'm interested in knowing what like yeah how urban life is. Yeah, with or this people stuff. that left Christianity who were always in churches that were more liberal. Yes. Like I was in a church that was LGBT friendly. I was in a church that had women in leadership. I was in a church that, um, well, yeah, you didn't. Did, did no, you? like, like this is a hypothetical okay, okay. Cool, cool person. <laughs> I was like, that, wait like, a second. No, no, no. This was not me. <laughs> yeah. So this is a hypothetical person that is like grown up yeah, yeah. in a progressive church <laughs> oh, yeah. who's still like. But, but I fundamentally think the teachings of the Bible are wrong, so that's why I left. I'm yeah. I'm curious from hearing that perspective, right, like. Right, right. Yeah, like or people I, that came from a small town like I did and went to a bigger city and realized, oh, I can be a lot more liberal, yeah. and, you know. And I find that sort of Christianity more malleable and more um, respectable, mm-hmm. in my opinion, in my viewpoints now. But thank you so much. Yeah, you're for welcome. Coming. Thank y'all. Thank you all very much for listening. Um, we are going to end this episode with two stories that are a little bit more R-rated. If you have R kids in the Renee. car, you might want to hit pause <laughs> R now. R for Renee. <laughs> R for Renee. Hey, have you ever seen a Marvel film? And if you're not an idiot, you waited until after the end of the credits to see the teaser for the next Marvel film. Here's one-eyed Nick Fury with a story about masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be hard to edit, but That's I'm going to make me. it work. So, Renee, uh, we talked a little bit about about your uh, the uh, emergence of your sexuality as mm-hmm. a uh, how old were you when you had your first orgasm? Twenty six. That's not a question. You just asked six women. years old. <laughs> yeah, no, I just asked that out of the blue. I didn't know the answer prior to that. How it old might are have been you? Twenty seven. How okay. old are you? How much do you weigh? When did you have your first orgasm? <laughs> What's your social security this number? Is standard questionnaire stuff. Uh, Renee, I'm, uh, you, okay. you shared the story of that with us over the break. Do you, are you okay with sharing that with our audience? Oh yeah. Oh, right. Okay. So, I mean, also like, am I okay? Or I think the answer would be, I am ridiculously proud of this story. <laughs> so, True. This, you should see your face. I was in the midst of, uh, deconstructing my sex, my, my, my Christianity and my sexuality and, um, like at this point, I was like, yeah, you know, I'm not sure that the Bible actually says that you should be in commitment, committed monogamous relationships for your whole life. And this is partly like based on the fact that like all the patriarchs of the Bible have concubines and multiple wives. And I'm like, does this egalitarian God really say it's OK for men to bang whoever they want and not let women get on on the action? Like that doesn't seem fair. So I, it, there's like a lot of thoughts going through my head. And I'm, I'm finally like, you know what? I've never masturbated. I, Renee, am making the formal decision to masturbate. And then because I'm, I'm a very academic person, I say, I'm going to research how to masturbate. And so I do what any academically minded person does who wants to get a crowdsourced overview of uh, sort of the what masturbation is. I go to wikipedia.com. The mm-hmm. the haven of all intellectuals. Yeah, you know, I actually, like, you know when Wikipedia does their annual, like, fundraiser, fundraiser yeah. I'm like, I, I owe it to them. So hey. I, I go to wikipedia.com and I, I search masturbation and then I read their article on masturbation. Soaking up every detail. Soaking up every detail, like taking notes, being like, ah, okay, ah, I understand Because for some this. reason you were an old lady when yeah, you were and, and, You know, like a great way to use Wikipedia is to read it and then go down to the bottom where they cite their sources right. and link to the academic sources. Yes, so yes. Mm-hmm. I like read the Wikipedia page and I, I linked the academic sources that they have based their article on masturbation on. And I'm like, I, I understand now. And uh, I was... I was <laughs> Fully understand masturbation. <laughs> like, like, you know, like I, yeah. I could write like a half page summary sort of like for a, my professor. Sort of like a, a white African studies professor. Yeah. <laughs> you understand masturbation. So I, I, I understand it and I am 
um, house sitting for a woman in my church. Um, and oh, oh. <laughs> somebody else's house. So I'm at her house and, and it's a nice house. And I, I romance myself, which is one of the things that I had read you, you could do. I, I um, <laughs> fill the tub with warm water and I light candles and I put on romantic music and I'm like, like, like touching my nips like fingering yeah. my, my my titties and I, <laughs> and, and I step into the tub absolutely and then I get there and I'm like well I don't actually know how this works but I, I knew even as a conservative Christian I knew that the basics of of sex is that like you got a, a wiener yes. and a snatch yeah yeah and <laughs> that's those are the words they used in church yeah so there there's like a a wiener and a snatch, and the wiener goes in the snatch, and and like penis in vagina. Um, I guess to masturbate and to like uh, approximate sex, I just have to like poke up there and feel something. So I get my pointer finger and my middle finger, and I just jam it up, <laughs> and I break my hymen, and or I stretch my hymen, yeah. and and so I'm I'm bleeding everywhere. <laughs> And I'm like well, in a in the in a bathtub, in a bathtub. Right? so there's like so, this so there's, this sort of like the psycho the scene in Psycho when she gets stabbed in the shower. Yeah, so I, I'm like bleeding into the bathtub, and and I think, oh, the, uh, uh, ooh, I, I think I need more practice. <laughs> but you were you were baptized by both blood and water. Yeah. So um, I would just like to point out that Brady was literally I, cracking I, up I, through I, that entire to, story. He was not breathing. I was, yeah, I, I, I like let I opened up the tub and watched my blood go down the drain, oh and I was like, okay, so surprisingly, in this one instance, the only possible instance in the world, Wikipedia was not useful. <laughs> that's the takeaway. Uh, okay, so that's the takeaway. Yeah, that's the takeaway from that story. Uh, um, you have a you have one more story yeah, to share I have, with I have us another... about about your. Your theology, this, this your theology of sexuality. Yeah, this is, if you will, this isn't. It's not actually this is my theology Presbyterian of sexuality. S- this is not my theology of sexuality, but it's like this sexual encounter that helped lead me away from Christianity. So, I am uh, in the midst of questioning a lot of things about my faith, and I was uh, volunteering with an institution. <laughs> Um, that offers services to refugees. And I was volunteering in a citizenship literacy class and uh, which where we we helped refugees uh, pass the citizenship test. And um, and I'm reading Richard Dawkins, The God Delusion. And this guy in my class looks at me and he says, oh, The God Delusion. Did you get to the part where it says God doesn't exist? (laughs) And I said, what a smart ass. I said, do you mean the title? And he said, (laughs) yeah, yeah. He said, it always surprised me how, how long that book is considering that it says only one thing. And I said, have you ever tried reading the Bible? Uh, Oh, Oh! (laughs) so, um, (laughs) so this guy was like my, my like illicit love affair. Um, like he, I, I referred to him once as a bad boy and he, he's exactly the opposite of what you would think when you think bad boy, like nebbish, bookish nerd who wears button up shirts, um, and is a lawyer. Uh, um, but, but he was bad to me because <laughs> I was a conservative Christian yeah. and he was a rich and bitter atheist ex-Catholic yes. <laughs> who had, who had uh, done it. Ultimate. He, had done, he had done it and so he and i are dating and we're not exactly dating we're like attracted to each other and uh i'm at the point where i'm like reading wikipedia for articles on masturbation yeah, to try yeah, to figure yeah. out my sexuality um and i'm i'm at his house and uh we're making out i'm like on top of him i can feel his erection and he i, I think being more experienced uh says Oh, you're really going to hell now. <laughs> Which, like, may- maybe would be hot. And so I, I said, uh, "Oh, not really, because, uh, like, I was born bound for hell anyway, because, uh, like, of my sin nature." And he says, "What?" And I said, 
have you ever read any John Calvin? You know, <laughs> <laughs> and I can feel like this. like it's been like really hot. Like we're like a little bit unbuttoned, and 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 like I said, I could feel his erection, and suddenly it's like recoiling into his body, <laughs> like 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 making a getaway, like fleeing, and <laughs> and he says. No, I have not read any John Calvin. And I said, well, so John Calvin talks about this idea of total depravity. There's a useful <laughs> acronym in the five points of Calvinism, TULIP. T is for total depravity. U is for unlimited. And, 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 and I said, so, so basically, like, I can't get any worse. Like, I'm not going to add a bad thing. Like, I'm already, I am already totally depraved. And he says, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that everyone is bad? And I said, I don't know. Mm. And he said, what do you mean you don't know? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a simple question. Yeah. And uh, and I, so I'm like, like sitting on him and I, I like cock myself back and I say, huh. And he sits there. Like, well, we're supposed to be having, like, sexy times watching me have an epiphany as I, like, try to decide whether or not humanity is at its core sinful. And then I remember that this is supposed to be sexy. And I said, do you want to know how Augustine thought sin nature was transmitted? Through the semen. <laughs> you are cock blocked by John you're doing Calvin. A, you're doing a great. <laughs> not many people can say that. Uh, <laughs> the end there are a couple of reasons i wanted to tell the stories <laughs> on the air <laughs> can't handle it i'm like I can, there are a couple of I reasons i can feel her recoiling back into it <laughs> like i brought semen up that was good. That's yeah. yeah semen yeah. always gets people going. I'm a depraved girl. Yes, I am. Totally. Uh, totally. There totally are a couple depraved. of reasons that I wanted to tell that story on the air. One is that they those are hilarious stories. Oh Boy, thank God. you. Thank you for telling yes. those stories. Are you welcome? The other one is that, uh, uh, as indoctrinated Christians, we are all on some level afraid of our sexuality. Maybe still. Maybe not. Mm -hmm, maybe mm -hmm, we've gotten mm -hmm. over it. Maybe we haven't. But uh, there is uh, nothing to be afraid of, is there? There's, There's not. nothing to hide. There's not. Because we are just humans that are sexual, and uh, we all are discovering that on our own yeah. way and in our own path. And it's a really beautiful thing to learn about yourself in that way, mm -hmm. even when there are really silly bathtub stories and... Uh, when your dirty talk involves John Calvin. <laughs> and also, like, and at all any of that point, is okay. you can question your basic precepts. Like, yes. at any point, you can say, <laughs> do I really believe that all of humanity is innately bad and born bad and incapable of doing good? Yes. Huh. Even when you're on top of a boy. Yeah. Chuck, I think you're the only person who could have gotten a Danny Tanner moment out of those stories. <laughs> I'll put in some guitar music Thank when you. I edit. Da -da 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 -da. Um. Thank you, Renee, for sharing that. Thank you that. so much. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, do not be afraid of your sexuality. Do not be afraid of hell. Love yourself. This is The Life After. I'm Chuck Parson. And I'm Brady Harden. And I'm Renee Badnock. Woohoo! Woo! <laughs> oh, this is going to be so good.